Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Michael Parrish, uh, Professor of History Emeritus at uh, UCSD. For the next few hours, uh, my colleagues and I from the humanities and the social sciences on this campus will endeavor to cast our own poor lights on the recent presidential election. Initially, I would like each member of our uh, distinguished panel to briefly introduce themselves, starting on my right. I'm Stefan Haggard. I teach at the Graduate School of Global Policy and Strategy, and I work on international politics, particularly on Asia. My name is Jamal Kokar, and I'm president of the Institute of the Americas, recently arrived and prior to this, I was Canada's ambassador to Brazil and in the Foreign Service for Canada for the last 30 years. And I'm David Mares. I'm distinguished professor of political science, and I'm the director of the Center for Iberian and Latin American Studies. Uh, I work on international politics. Hassan Kayali, associate professor of history, and I work on the very late Ottoman Empire. I'm Deborah Hertz. I'm the woke chair in modern Jewish studies. I teach Holocaust, Zionism, MMW, and I'm writing a book on radical Jewish women. Uh, Paul Pickowitz, a professor also in the Department of History, and my specialty is the history of modern China. Good afternoon. I'm Henry Migala, and I'm the director for the International House here on campus. We have uh, two uh, fundamental questions that the panel is going to attempt to address uh, this afternoon. First of all, uh, how do we account for the results of the past election on November 8th? And second of all, what do those results uh, portend about uh, the future of the American party system, about the future of the presidency, uh, the future of the federal courts, including the Supreme Court of the United States, the state of social relationships and civil society in America after the elections, the possible trajectory of domestic public policies, and of course our nation's relationship uh, to the rest uh, of the world. There are a few pundits who are already comparing uh, November 8 with 9-11. Uh, as a watershed event that has fundamentally reshaped the landscape of American life. Now, historians like myself are notoriously poor uh, soothsayers and should always be cautious about reading the present in light of tempting analogies from the past. Strangely, there are many non-historians who seem to exhibit greater confidence in the efficacy of history as a guide uh, to the present and to the future. The famous uh, philosopher Santa Ana, of course, made the remark that those who do not remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And Karl Marx, of course, famously said that history does repeat itself first as tragedy and then as farce. So permit me to throw caution to the wind in my initial opening here to suggest some parallels between our possible uh, future in the years ahead and an American past a hundred years ago. The year was 1920, and the Republican Party at that time swept into national power, the presidency and both houses of Congress in the wake of an unpopular world war, and two decades of progressive liberal reform. They were led by a presidential candidate, a former senator from the state of Ohio. And his administration uh, dissolved in unprecedented scandals. Director of the Veterans Administration was sent to prison. So was the Secretary of the Interior. And the Attorney General escaped indictment because he died before that event. President Harding was followed by the taciturn former governor of Massachusetts, who famously said that the business of America is business. Whether he included the presidency in those remarks is unknown. In the early days of the 1920s, there was horrific white on black violence 
where mobs rocked black communities in Tulsa, Chicago, St. Louis, and dozens of smaller cities. Out of those events, a black man by the name of Marcus Garvey organized the Universal Negro Improvement Association as a way of responding to what he believed to be the weakness not only of the NAACP, but the growing white violence directed at African Americans. During the early years of that uh, decade, the Ku Klux Klan rode high in state and local politics from Indianapolis to Denver to Portland. And even the Democratic Party refused to repudiate the Klan at its 1924 national convention. It was a time in which historian John Hyam has called the tribal 20s, the tribal 20s. Wilsonian internationalism was repudiated with the defeat of the Versailles Treaty and the League of Nations, and later Congress refused to join the World Court. The highest protective tariffs since the late 19th century were adopted in 1921 and 1930, tightening the noose around global trade and fomenting the economic nationalism that followed in the 1930s. New immigration laws in 1921 and 1924 imposed a national origins and quota system that survived until 1965, slamming the door on Southern and Eastern Europeans and virtually all people attempting to come from Asian countries. Three federal revenue laws supported by Congress slashed the personal income tax rate the corporate tax, capital gains, inheritance, and even the estate tax, altogether accelerating the economic inequality and setting the stage both for the great stock market crash and the Great Depression. What novelist John Dos Passos called America's two nations, one rural, rural, one urban, remained divided along religious and cultural fault lines best symbolized by prohibition and by the Al Smith Herbert Hoover election at the end of the decade in 1928. Our format today will be as follows. Each of our panelists will have eight to ten minutes to address their perspective on the meaning of 11-8 and what it may portend for this country. We will then have a short period when panelists may in fact address particular questions to one another. And finally, we hope that members of the audience may direct questions to one or more members of the panel, and I will attempt uh, to moderate. It is my uh, great pleasure to turn to our first uh, panelist this afternoon, Professor Samuel Popkin from the Department of Political Science. Sam. Um, I didn't. I didn't know the twenties were called the tribal twenties, but it's, it seems perfect because that's when um, Fred Trump was very active in New York as a builder. Donald's father, who was um, picked up at a racial riot in New York that was organized by the Klan. We don't know if he was just a bystander or not, but he was taken in and charged at the time. And there's nothing more tribal in any city in America than the construction industry in New York City, where every different union is a different ethnic group. And that's where the, the Trump family made their money and, and their fortune. Um, quite an interesting family, in fact the uncle who would not be allowed in the country under the proposed immigration changes, Fred Trump, was the director of the radiation lab at MIT during World War II, developed radar, was the co-inventor of the Van de Graaff generator, and has the King George Medal of Honor from England and the National Medal of Science from the United States, and his sister is a pro-choice judge on the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals in, in Washington. So every, she, every family has one. 
what can I say? It, every family has one. And what is the meaning of 2008? I mean, of 2016, it means suddenly Mitt Romney, who was the GOAT of 2012, is one of the people everybody is hoping will save America from his party's victory this year. And um, it's just one of the ironies. The Washington Post today pointed out that to talk about the split in the country between the dense concentrated areas of Democrats and the less um, densely populated sparse rural areas and small towns populated by people we didn't know were so concerned about how we live in our areas. Um, Donald Trump carried 2,600 American counties and Hillary Clinton carried 500 American counties. The 500 counties that were carried by Hillary Clinton have 65% of the industrial output of the United States. The 2,600 that Donald Trump care, cover, have about a third. So I think when Governor Romney in 2012 talked about the makers and the takers, he got the parties backwards. The, the, the states that were blue in this election are the states that pay all the federal taxes. The states that live a lot off of those taxes are the red states. And that actually is part of the fear of this, this recent wave of immigration. And what I've been worrying about for the last two days is how we will absorb the Hispanic wave and will it, will it take as long as it did with African Americans after the Civil Rights Revolution or Irish after um, nine, Al Smith, from Al Smith to John Kennedy? And I think the answer is no. Um, Donald Trump got to be president because the Republican Party was so bitterly divided that none of the candidates trying to satisfy the party, the accepted norms of the party, could get a majority from their own voters. Um, two things hold the party together, the coalitions that we have. One is you get something out of the coalition when you pass bills, and the other part is you all agree that the other side's your enemy. And when you control Congress but not the presidency, you have real troubles deciding what to do because the only way for a congressman or a senator to make themselves a name is to be on the far left or the far right. Elizabeth Warren or Newt Gingrich or somebody who really stands out promising to do things that they can't get 50 votes in their own party to do. So they're selling us dreams and some of them everybody in this room believes are practical. Some of them everybody in this room would believe are totally absurd nonsense that could never happen or they would have already been done. And you can decide which are, are realistic and which are stupid or racist or foolish or just economic bankruptcy. And when you have this, the, the house and all you can do is talk big and try to do radical things, you live off vilifying the other side. You know, you, you, you make them the enemy. You hold hearings. Um, when the Republicans win, one of the sayings in the 40s was, we'll open every, every session of Congress with a prayer and end every session with a subpoena. And the last, the last round, the last percent, if you listen to all the discussions of the pollsters, and I was a pollster in five presidential campaigns, whatever mistakes did or did not get made in the campaign, if the last round of eight days of FBI saying, well, there's more, there's more emails and we haven't searched them yet, and that breaks a longstanding norm that you never do anything in the last 60 days of a campaign, that made just enough difference to, to probably tip it because the four battleground Midwestern states in total were 100,000 votes. But that's, that's another story. The, the Trump victory is because everybody in the Republican Party agreed something had to be done about immigration. The, the whole, the, the, the guts of the party in Florida the governors in Texas, but not some of the senators, the 
establishment, the businesses and the party in at least four of the major Hispanic states all believed you needed immigration reform. And it was broken up under President Bush by Brian Bilbray when he beat Francine Busby in a special election in 2005, and he only ran on one thing, stopping immigration. And they came close <clears throat> in 2013 to solving the problem and having some form of amnesty and some form of citizenship. And that was broken up first by Senator Cruz and then when one congressman lost to a Tea Party person in 2014, Eric Cantor, and Dave Bratt, who got 30,000 votes, to, it was all it took to win in the Republican primary in Virginia, ran a one-note campaign, and it was trusting Eric Cantor <clears throat> with immigration is like trusting Barack Obama with health care. And that's all, that's all he needed to win, and that was the end of any possibility. Nobody wanted to admit, if everybody, and, and with people like Ted Cruz leading the way, amnesty was ruled out. The party was, was ferocious, no amnesty. And it's the same sentiment. It is not as much a racial sentiment as it is an economic sentiment. It's not, the people are not comfortable in the small towns with the culture change, but they're most terrified of losing Medicare and Social Security. And part of Obamacare, the, America, the Affordable Care Act, whether we like it or not, was redistribution. And the thin line between redistribution and insurance is very blurred when there are ethnic and racial differences. All over this country now, in every metropolitan area, as diversity grows, people spend are less certain about spending money on roads, parks, and schools. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real phenomena. <clears throat> and I don't think when you live in California, you're as aware of it as you are in other parts of the country. If, if, if you, I grew up in a Trump world of northern Midwest, although my county voted blue, thank God, still. And living here, I can't imagine going back to a world where the only ethnic cleavage are the Norwegians against the Swedes and the Finns. I mean, it's hard to imagine the, the difference between that and, and the world I love and live in today, but it takes time for the other world to digest it, and especially when there's the concern about jobs and work that was not strong in, 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 the, in, the, in the Democratic campaign this time. Approximately 10 to 15 percent of the people in these areas who voted for Donald Trump voted for Barack Obama in 2012. So don't just say it's all race or they're all racist. It's more complicated. It's a lot of fears about holding on and protecting what they've got and the fact that there are implicit racial issues in, that they're not even aware of sometimes and the worries about the people who come and are not working and are getting some of the benefits that will bleed them and they won't get their Medicare is a, is a concern that's very hard to deal with. And now it's up to the Republicans, it's up to Donald Trump. Paul Ryan traveled the country with a program for Congress. It was a program that the party could agree on, and the party could agree on the Paul Ryan program because he never mentioned the words abortion, immigration, or foreign trade. He said, well, those are divisive. Let's talk about the ones we can agree on. Well, Donald Trump's entire campaign was foreign trade, immigration, and he promised absolutely to nominate um, judges who believed in, were pro-life. So the party is badly split. And this happened with the election of Dwight Eisenhower, who the Republican, even though he was a national hero and remembered as one, the Republicans resented and hated Eisenhower being pushed down the throat of the conservatives as much as 
as much as Trump. I mean, I know it's funny to put Eisenhower and Trump in the same category of anything, and I, Eisenhower fans, I apologize, but they were these outsiders who won despite their party, and the same thing happened really with Jimmy Carter. Eisenhower got two terms, Jimmy Carter got one. Eisenhower did what he had, what Eisenhower did to govern was when he wanted, when, when he needed an international program over the heads of the conservatives who were, you know, anti-trade, anti-involvement, no United Nations, he did it by completely talking and dealing with Lyndon Johnson, who, who then the Democrats in the Senate and the House would save him, and then he in turn gave them their most of their domestic programs as a trade. Donald Trump is already facing total resistance on infrastructure from the anti-spending groups in his own party, and the Democrats have said, we'll deal with you. Now we get into a very interesting trading period of what will he actually be trustworthy on, what kind of things will he deliver, and what can the Democrats stop him on? Uh, the notion of total resistance, and you are not my president when you're a senator or congressman, is not going to work. They're going to have to find a way to protect their people in exchange for giving Trump something. I mean, when it comes to new programs, he's just a senator with 16 votes, and that's the difference between an override and something he will sign. Other than that, he can do a lot on the environment by just issuing new regulations, and he can play some games on tariffs. But any EPA change takes at least a year for hearings and, and changes to the regulation. So the notion of a total change of the world overnight is not going to happen. And I'm sorry I took longer. Than Thank you very much. I would like to call on uh, Stephen Haggard now. Stephen? Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, there are a lot of people here who are going to be talking about particular foreign policy issues, so I thought I would uh, lead off by making some more general comments about uh, likely uh, foreign policy strategies under a Trump administration. But let me begin with a, a, a pithy characterization of Mr. Trump that was given by Selena Zito in a piece that she wrote in uh, September Atlantic. She said, um, the press uh, takes Mr. Trump literally but not seriously and his supporters take him seriously, but not literally. And I think that that's actually good advice for all of us at this juncture, because I think some of the things that Mr. Trump said during the campaign, he's obviously already started to walk back on. And so the general impulse to, for example, do something on trade, do something about the alliances may still be there, but exactly how that's done is, uh, is still to be seen. Um, the second cliche I want to I want to use, which I think is correct, is that personnel is policy, and to date we really only have two appointments that deal directly with what I would call foreign policy. Jeff Sessions is sometimes put in that camp because his stance uh, stances are important with respect to uh, immigration, but we have Michael Flynn as the National Security Advisor, and Mike Pompeo at CIA. Both of those suggest that Mr. Trump will be preoccupied with issues in the Middle East and with uh, Islamic fundamentalism, as he's wont to call it, in particular. Um, how that plays out, though, I think we're already having the first crisis of a Trump presidency, because the day after he had his conversation with Mr. Putin last week, the Russians announced a, a bombing campaign in, in Syria, which was supposedly aimed at, at uh, Islamic fundamentalist groups, but in fact ended up sweeping up uh, civilians in Aleppo and opposition forces, which the United States is maintaining, so uh, seeking to support. So um, there's going to be a question of whether he's drawn back to a more bipartisan kind of foreign policy uh, that some of us suspect he might, or whether he'll sustain his somewhat more idiosyncratic views. So in that regard, um, let me just emphasize that you wouldn't know it from this campaign, but actually American foreign policy does have some very strongly bipartisan components to it. And those include uh, maintenance of a, a substantial military, military primacy, particularly with respect to the Navy and control of the seas, uh, support for the alliances, mainly for balancing purposes against Russia and China, and support for an open world economy. 
And I think as we've all seen, um, one of the questions of a Trump presidency is the extent to which he'll be pulled back to that, those core elements of a bipartisan foreign policy or whether he'll pursue these other views. So what do we have to go on? Um, we actually don't have that much to go on. Uh, Mr. Trump made one, uh, s uh, I would call, substantive speech on foreign policy and national security issues during the campaign in September in Philadelphia. Uh, it's a serious speech. It contains a substantial critique of the Clinton foreign policy. But its main message was uh, that the U.S. foreign policy should, be a, should pursue a strategy of peace through strength. Uh, but what I don't think has been fully appreciated is exactly how much strength uh, Mr. Trump thought the United States should be buying. And in fact, um, this is a major military buildup, which he has promised. And what's interesting are, are the components of it as well. It's not just uh, the army, an increase in troop strength of about 50,000, which is roughly 10%, or in the Marines, but an, a very substantial increase in our naval capabilities, about 85 surface vessels and submarines. Now, I think there are two issues with this um, strategy. Uh, first of all is whether he can actually get it through, because it conflicts directly, as Sam said, with some of the fiscal hawks on the Hill, how will this be funded? How will this be funded in the context of making commitments with respect to infrastructure as well? But then I think even more puzzling is the question of how such forces would actually be used because uh, uh, Mr. Trump also has this non-intervention, a streak, and so presumably this buildup would be for the purpose of general deterrence, but some of his surrogates have suggested that the United States might also be more forward in certain areas. Um, curiously, and no one has made any mention of this at all, I think one of the places to watch in terms of a, of a Trump uh, foreign policy is Afghanistan of all places. Because as you may or may not remember, at the end of last year, uh, uh, President Obama committed to leaving about 8,500 uh, American forces in, in Afghanistan. And it's certainly seen as a, a kind of test of whether the strategy of disengagement would be pursued under a Trump presidency or whether those kinds of commitments will, uh, will be sustained. And certainly Asia and South Asia in particular are looking very closely at what might happen in Afghanistan, which the pu American public has generally forgotten. Everyone's focused on Syria. Uh, let me say something uh, very quickly about the, the claims with respect to trade. Uh, I think everyone knows that President Obama basically pulled the plug on TPP um, two weeks ago as it became clear that uh, uh, following the election that there'd be no support for it going forward on the Hill. Uh, I personally think that this is unfortunate, but uh, the Democratic Party, neither the Democratic Party nor the Republican Party was supportive of this particular action. Ironically, I think it's going to leave the field of trade policy in East Asia uh, significantly the Chinese. And again, ironically, because uh, as we saw from President Xi's statements at the APEC summit, uh, China is quite willing to lead on this issue and has, a, has its own trade initiative for East Asia, which is already in place, the so-called RECEP. So uh, the loss of the TPP raises a whole series of issues about American credibility in Asia and with respect to the world economy more generally, regardless of what you think of the particularities of that agreement. Now, um, the question is, what will uh, Mr. Trump actually do uh, on trade policy? And here, uh, again, there's been some walking back from some of the more extreme actions. Uh, uh, again, this is a sort of technical point, but it makes no sense right now to declare China currency manipulator because the currency is appreciating, not depreciating. Um, and it makes no sense to talk about across the board 45% tariffs either because I think everyone knows that that would be disastrous for the U.S. economy. Um, but the big questions, I think, are things like NAFTA. Um, what does it mean to renegotiate NAFTA or tear NAFTA up? Um, this is an agreement which has basically become the institutional foundations for several key industries in the United States, most notably the automobile industry. But even within San Diego, industries such as aerospace depend very heavily on the integration which is provided by the NAFTA. And so the question of what it would mean to take, rip that up or perfect it, I mean, we were talking, I was talking uh, with a colleague earlier today and we were uh, speculating that in fact this idea of renegotiating the NAFTA may actually push in the direction of deepening the NAFTA because it's not clear how you would uh, renegotiate the NAFTA to uh, impose higher tariffs between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. 
So I suspect on the trade front that probably what we'll see are some enforcement actions with respect to uh, trade with China, uh, countervailing duties dumping, uh, for example, in an industry such as steel, which again, ironically, is very similar to what uh, Secretary Clinton actually promised to do uh, prior to the election. So I'll stop there and leave it to the others on foreign policy. Thank you very much. We will uh, next hear from Professor uh, Kokar. Well, I can't admit to being a professor. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm not a professor, and I'm going to approach this from the perspective of what my job was, and that was as a foreign policy practitioner having to deal with a new administration coming in. And uh, at that time, I was in Washington, D.C. when uh, George W. came into power after Clinton. And as a Canadian diplomat at the time, of course, we were concerned with many of the same issues that people are concerned with today, uh, the unsigning of international treaties and documents, um, backing away from uh, climate um, uh, institutions and where were we going to sit on, on, on a range of foreign policy and security related issues. Um, and I think one thing to remember is, um, as a practitioner, is, is for us not to get overly exercised about the policy pronouncements, because as, as uh, Professor Haggard just said, a lot will be actually worked out um, in the execution and less in the, in the words right now. I think it's more, from our perspective, a question of attitude, uh, probably more than immediately policy pronouncements. And the attitude doesn't look good, for sure. Um, but in terms of policy pronouncements, he's already backing away from certain things, which um, do trouble, I think, uh, the international community as a, as a, as a whole. But let me, let me point to two or three things in terms of the things that um, your closest neighbor and ally whether it's your first or second largest trading partner, certainly your largest energy source, uh, energy partner, uh, would be concerned about. On NAFTA, um, I think you're right. I think we actually would welcome a certain opening of it to look at certain deepening of the aspects of, of work that's unfinished, um, certain terms of labor and mobility and visa issues that Canada has traditionally concerned itself with. Um, and prior to NAFTA, Canada had an FTA with the United States that governed a lot of the work that was done, and an auto pack, and a defense sharing agreement that governed a lot of the, the deep parts of the trade that was done between our two countries. There are persistent irritants that come up, whether it's in agriculture, like country of origin labeling for meat products, or, um, or softwood lumber, but some of the core work that happens between our two countries will continue, I think, to be governed by, if not the NAFTA, the FTA, and the provisions that were there. So to a certain degree, I think certainly the government wouldn't necessarily object to having that conversation and see what is it that Mr. Trump and his team would have in mind. I think the one thing that we'd want to be concerned about is, you know, in terms of the larger NAFTA relationship, what does this mean for Mexico from a North American trading perspective? Certainly on the, uh, on the, on the regional aspects, uh, when you look at TPP, um, I think you're right. I think Canadians, which tend to be more Asian than Latin, um, will certainly look towards the relationship with China and what does it mean for that. And when I say we're more Asians than Latin, our immigration is in fact far more so from China and um, South Asia generally, um, and, and Europe than it is in, in, in the United States. So, uh, you know, we have a, a very different perspective in terms of that trade. Uh, trade with Mexico is key. Uh, and the NAFTA relationship. Um, but we're pretty optimistic that in terms of a, a civil discourse and a, and a good conversation that with practitioners, you'll come up to some pretty sensible solutions. At the end of the day, the industry groups um, and global value chains are the ones that are going to dictate a lot of what American policy is going to be driven by. Um, and I still think that irrespective of where, where the, the, the politics might end up, I think the industry associations and the actual participants of trade will have a pretty strong voice in those, in those negotiations as they always have had. Um, one of the things that's, that's ironic from a Canadian perspective is that we just elected um, in Canada probably the antidote to what you've just elected here. Um, and I'm very happy to say that. And, and, and Justin Trudeau's father, um, probably a far more famous prime minister than Justin ever 
likely will be, but um, said that when the United States sneezes, Canada catches cold or pneumonia. And of course, that's, that, that is the case. I mean, Canada is, is in fact like California, but colder, right? We're 30, uh, 30 million, 35 million people for your 30, and um, large agricultural bells, high tech, uh, as well as uh, energy and natural resource at its base, um, and immigration, a population that is diverse. Um, but aside from that, if you look at the diversity that Canada has to offer, this is where I think the, the interesting story is for the bilateral relationship. We are, um, in, in some respects, driven by a very pluralistic and multicultural um, approach to the way we govern society. So um, our cities, so we're 30 million people spread across a 150 mile ribbon, if you quill north of the border. But if you look at our, our, our top global cities, and usually three of them are always in the top 10 of the most livable cities in the world. Um, so let's use Toronto, for example, which is roughly 3 million people. Over 48% of that city, over 48% of that city is foreign born. Over 40% or 50% don't speak English as a, or French as a primary language in the home, although they do speak English and French. That's not the principal language that they would speak at home. Um, the racial mix in, in Toronto is kind of representative of what you have across Canada, except like in the United States, that vast mid, the, the, the middle part of the country, which is agricultural base. But the cities are very cosmopolitan in, in, in the broadest sense of the world in terms of, in terms of integration. And while we have the challenges that you face in large American cities or in fact in European cities as well, um, there's a different approach to it. And, and there's a great effort, a conscious effort, a policy effort at um, not stoking the fires of religious divisions or cultural divisions or ethnic divisions. Um, so it stands in sharp contrast to some of the conversations that are taking place here. Um, that's not to say one country is necessarily better than the other, although I am Canadian. Um, it is to say, though, I think it, it's, it's a fundamental driver of policy. But, you know, we like to say that, that it's attitudes and leadership that also shapes the minds and the, and the hearts and the minds, if you will, of people of the co across the country. And it, it takes some time stretching beyond even your own beliefs um, to go to a kind of a greater good. And um, so I think that, that, that relationship will be a difficult one to, to kind of bridge in terms of if the attitudes in the White House, particularly in the, in the leadership that he's chosen so far, continue to maintain, because I'm not sure how you conduct certain types of conversations with that sharp division in terms of perspectives. I think where you will find a, a lot more commonality, uh, depending on where, where the, this administration goes on climate, is on the energy, um, on the energy uh, issue. Of course, we, again, as I mentioned, are your number one supplier of energy. I think it'll be interesting to see, um, once you get past the rhetoric, what that actually means in terms of using innovation in energy to address some of the challenges that you have here on coal and clean coal. Um, what role the nu nuclear energy plays into this, what's the role of renewables. Um, between the United States and Canada in this hemisphere, we're actually fairly lucky if you think of energy self-sufficiency. Um, and so that will have a long-term kind of, there will be some very pragmatic and practical implications for that. The other side of it is in terms of the global agenda, um, it's kind of, it's, a, it's an oft-used phrase and often overused phrase in terms of the triangle between food, fuel, and water um, in terms of addressing sort of global challenges. And I think on global issues, so far as he doesn't dump global architecture as a means by which to conduct these conversations um, in a practical way, um, I think there's going to be a pl plenty of scope for collaboration. And again, notwithstanding governments, one of the things that I think over generations of, uh, of watching um, U.S.-Canada relations, we can always rely on those very much stronger people-to-people -people links and industry-to-industry -industry links that exist on both sides of the border to sort of break ground, if you will, that nature of, of policy between our two countries. And I'm, I think we're hopeful back in, in, in Ottawa, though I can't speak for the government right now, is that will continue in the future, is that it will be our industries and the people themselves 
um, within those groups and our agricultural communities and other that will help shape and define policy moving forward. So um, typically Canadian, being kind of relaxed about this, see, not get too worked about it, and let's see what he actually does with some of the policies because as, as, uh, as Samuel and Stephen, uh, Steph uh, Stephen, I want to say Stephen, Stephen has said, um, the policy is in, in shift right now, right? And, and he's already backing away from a, a number of pronouncements, so um, there's always hope. Our next speaker will be Professor David Maris from the Department of Political Science. David? Thank you. Well, as you've gotten the sense already, it's far too early to talk about the impact of a Trump administration uh, on any place, because we don't know what this administration is gonna look like. We don't know what this individual is actually gonna do. He says one thing one day, says something different the other day. This morning he said he wasn't gonna to have to go, go after Hillary. She'd suffered enough, right? Uh, after having promised that he'd send her to jail. Um, so I think one way to think about uh, what we should be discussing uh, is where to look for, not just his appointments as Steph uh, pointed out, but sort of what are the constraints on them? What are the limits? Uh, what are the opportunities that are out there? And in Latin America, there is a lot of discussion already about opportunities. Um, so uh, if we think about Trump's election, all right, it really was an election um, that many people in Latin America actually understand, right? He was elected, what put him over the edge was the vote of the losers in globalization okay, and the people who thought that neither of the two parties represented them or would speak for them. If you look at the pink tide in Latin America, which was the coming to power of the left in Latin America, most of that pink tide was fueled by a sense that the traditional parties in Latin America were not delivering Okay? And the voters for the pink tide were the losers in globalization. So one of the interesting things to read in Latin America today is how a lot of people on the left see this as a great opportunity. Okay? He's going to kill TPP, so we're not going to get sucked into it, despite what Colombia, Chile, and Costa Rica uh, want to do. Um, he... Um, uh, He's opening an opportunity for Latin America to integrate, get together, uh, and move away from the United States. Okay? Now, maybe he's opening that. I mean, I happen to think if you look at Latin America's history, it's not an opportunity is going to be taken advantage of by Latin America. I will say a few words about that. Uh, but before I get to Latin America, let me, let me say a couple of things that we should keep our eye on. Um, first, Trump himself. All right. He's an unknown, well, we know some things about him, all right, that he does move back and forth, that he's very uh, willing to, to go out on a limb on a number of things, and he can say one thing and turn immediately, all right? So keep that in mind. Um, his relationship with Congress is going to be really important, all right? Because unlike a lot of Latin American countries where, yes, there's a powerful president and the president can, you know, basically push Congress aside, it's going to be near impossible for Bush to do, uh, for, sorry, uh, for <laughs> Trump to do that. Okay, so he's going to have to work with Congress. And as we heard from uh, Sam, um, you know, that working with Congress could be working with Democrats on some issues. Okay. Uh, if you think about TPP, it was opposed by lots of Democrats. It was opposed by lots of environmentalists. Okay, so the, the eliminating TPP has some cost, but it has benefits to lots of other people uh, who uh, were opposed to it. Um, one of the areas to think about um, the impact of, of uh, Trump presidency is by looking at the U.S. economy. Okay, not at his policy, but what happens to the U.S. economy. Because the U.S. economy sucks and pulls, regardless of particular policies that an administration might 
adopt. Uh, so to the degree that uh, the U.S. economy booms, okay, that's going to create dynamics that whether or not you know, President uh, uh, Trump wants something to happen, those dynamics are going to create things. If, on the other hand, we hit inflation, we hit recession, uh, that's going to have its own dynamics too. And those things are going to have an impact on Latin America. And here, let me turn to Latin America, and the first thing I want to do is break Latin America. Okay, because the impact of what happens in the U.S. economy, the impact of a, Bush, of a Trump administration uh, is going to be varied depending on the different vulnerabilities, the different advantages that Latin American countries have. Because, in fact, they're not all the same. Okay, if we look at Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, okay, they're, in a way, they're the most vulnerable inherently, okay? Uh, they're not just neighbors, uh, they're the places where most of the migration from Latin America to the U.S. comes from. Uh, they're the places that are most impacted by remittances. Uh, they're the places, Mexico is the place, uh, thanks to NAFTA, uh, which is most integrated into the U.S. economy. So they're gonna, they're gonna sort of get the first shocks, the first advantages, uh, the first impact of what happens uh, in the United States. Um, it's not just if um, a President Trump uh, uh, is able to close the border, all right? Most people don't think he can close the border, all right? But if, if he sends people back, if he deports lots of people, all right? Uh, if you read the news, very few people think he's gonna send back 11 million people. All right, even the three million figure is not very credible, all right? But it could be in the tens of thousands of who? Of people in our jails, okay? Of undocumented people who have criminal records, all right? And what's, what happened the last time we sent back criminals to Mexico and Central America? Well, we didn't give them any warning that they were coming. And they're going into an area that has weak rule of law, weak police, weak civil societies, uh, and it's been chaos. Okay, so the very first impact I think we should be thinking about, rather than the remittances side, is really what's gonna happen if these criminals, you look at our jails, they're not rehabilitation places. Okay, they're, they're places where you learn how to be even a worse criminal. I'm not talking about county jail, I'm talking about state prisons, okay, federal prisons, all right? And we're gonna send them back to Mexico, to Central America, to the Caribbean, okay? There's no way they're prepared for that. So that's gonna have a really big negative impact uh, on those uh, places. Um, let me uh, switch quickly to uh, South America, and let me split South America here, okay? Venezuela and Colombia. Venezuela has serious problems that have very little to do with the United States. Okay? They have serious problems that have a lot to do with their own internal issues. Okay? Inequality, poor economic management, the worst uh, 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 mismanagement of the commodity boom which Latin America for decades had said, can't depend on primary commodities because the prices go up and then they go down. Raul Prebish, you know, Ecla, all that stuff. Well, you know, when the commodity boom hit this time, man, people just jumped on that bandwagon. And Venezuela was one of the worst. Okay, one of the worst for that. And now they're having to pay that price. And on top of that, you've got an, uh, a political crisis. Well, what's going to happen here? My bet is that the uh, um, Trump administration is going to push harder and harder and harder on Venezuela. And it's not going to invade. I've seen some, some discussion about, oh, in the past the U.S. invaded. The U.S. is not going to invade Venezuela. Okay, but there's going to be more pressure on the Venezuelans. There's going to be more um, uh, um, soplando, more supports for the extreme right in the opposition rather than the moderate right in the opposition, which is going to contribute to even more polarization uh, in Venezuela. 
Uh, so the United States isn't the cause of Venezuela's problems, but it's going to make them much worse under a Trump administration. If we look at who he's already think uh, uh, discussing uh, with in terms of Latin America, Colombia. Okay, Colombia had this real misfortune of voting against the peace agreement with the FARC. That wasn't the United States doing; that was Colombia's own doing. All right, the, the you know the uh, Santos administration has has negotiated a new deal. Okay, but the success of the peace agreement in Colombia depends heavily on foreign aid, foreign funding. Okay, and the Europeans talk a lot about peace, but they don't give very much money. And the Latin American neighbors talk a lot about peace, but they give no money. Okay, so who is the funder? It's the United States. Okay, well, it's not that Trump will say, I don't want peace, but first, the Trump administration is probably likely to look at two things. Okay, one is relationship with Congress, and this relationship with Congress, this Congress is gonna be unlikely to see the benefits in providing more aid to Colombia, okay? Uh, and if President Trump is trying to get more money out of Congress to fund infrastructure, to fund military buildup, that money's gotta come from somewhere, and it's not gonna go to Colombia, okay? Uh, and then it, within the Trump administration, given his national security advisors and whatnot, I mean, these are people who are, um, extremists on the national security side, and they're gonna to wanna to see, just like Uribe in Colombia, more punishment meted out to the FARC. Uh, so they won't be in favor of supporting this. Let me close then with uh, the rest of South America, Brazil and Argentina in particular. You know, I, I think Chile is probably gonna be the least affected. It has a bilateral free trade agreement with the United States. Um, you know, their economic shop is in pretty good shape. Their, their politics have a little problem, but they're pretty good shape. But Argentina and Brazil are trying to shift, okay? Uh, and they're gonna find that the United States is not particularly interested in making that shift from a more closed economy to a more open economy uh, easier. They're gonna look where? They're gonna look to China? Okay, well, they will be looking to China. Lots of people in Latin America are saying this is a great opportunity to look to China. But China's already, as we heard from Steph, uh, thinking about free trade in Asia, and the reality is that Latin America is not competitive with Asia. They're competitive only in primary commodities. So unfortunately, pulling away from the United States and looking towards Asia just pushes Latin America more and more dependency uh, on primary commodities. So let me end there. Uh, that you know, as I look at the U.S. relationship with Latin America, I don't think so much about the United States slapping Latin America. I don't think so much about these great opportunities for Latin America now to integrate together and say goodbye to the United States. Uh, we're going to be a player in the world ourselves. I really think that there are a lot of vulnerabilities in Latin America that Latin Americans need to address uh, and their ability to address that will have an impact on how Trump presidency and how China uh, will uh, affect them uh, in the future. Thank you. Professor Has uh, Hassan Kalali is next. Hassan. So um, on, the on the premise that we don't have that much to go on, I'm going to make some um, fairly impressionistic uh, remarks uh, as far as the Middle East goes. And I will talk a little bit about um, the reaction uh, to the elections in the Middle East. And again, that's also, uh, it's, it's too soon, uh, and I don't have um, um, uh, too much to go on. So uh, uh, take it some, uh, as some disparate uh, uh, remarks um, on the Middle East and Trump. Um, 
it's not easy to comment on uh, the outlooks and prospects of the uh, Trump presidency in the Middle East, but I think it's not easy to make such comments as far as um, any other region of the world is concerned. Candidate Trump has not articulated uh, a vision about the Middle East. Uh, he says that he has thought out uh, strategies, but sharing them publicly, he has argued, uh, would be foolish. Um, so we don't know. He has said he prefers uh, lesser American involvement in Middle Eastern uh, affairs. Um, and therefore, I'm um, uh, very interested in uh, what Stefan said, um, in that uh, he might be uh, preoccupied with issues in the Middle East. Certainly, that's not the impression that he gave uh, during the campaign. And um, what he has made clear um, uh, during the campaign uh, was that defeating ISIS uh, uh, would be his highest uh, priority. Now, for many, including Middle Easterners, uh, these utterances are neither here nor there. Um, the peoples of Middle Eastern countries uh, greeted the outcome of the U.S. elections with surprise and amusement. Um, the more liberal elements in the publics uh, of Middle Eastern countries, um, and those, uh, particularly those elements oppressed uh, by present regimes, received it with a sense of schadenfreude, or more charitably with the sentiment of, it happens to the best of us. Middle Eastern peoples are saddled by leaders who have uh, little regard for the rule of law, for basic freedoms and human rights, and other democratic principles ordinarily touted by the United States. Now they look to the United States and see something that is familiar to them. Uh, they see an emasculated democracy and uh, the, the tyranny of a minority um, one quarter of the country's adult population uh, 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 having voted uh, Trump in. Uh, trying to explain the Electoral College to Middle Easterners is as difficult as explaining the Iranian Supreme Revolutionary Council to Americans. Um, <laughs> Now, to those who take an interest in uh, contemporary Middle East um, and appreciate the intricate political, social, and cultural dynamics of the region, it is clear that generalizations about the region uh, and its peoples are quite uh, impossible. Nevertheless, um, one can say uh, that uh, Middle Easterners are, by and large, uh, apprehensive about uh, Donald Trump especially uh, in view of the disparagingly reductionist views he has voiced about uh, the faith of uh, most of them, about their region, and uh, the misfortunes and conflicts that beset them. I don't think they're, um, the Middle Easterners, um, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the, the Arab street, the Middle Eastern street, if there is such a thing, and neither takes uh, Trump seriously nor literally, but they're um, sort of insulted and galled anyway. Um, now, uh, Middle Eastern leaders, on the other hand, have started to and will continue to approach uh, the change of guard in Washington opportunistically to promote their own agendas vis-a-vis -vis, uh, president-elect who is uh, groping in the dark. They either hope for a clean slate upon which they can inscribe their own goals, or a power vacuum which will offer the right climate to do exactly that. The reality of our new president is dawning upon us now. We're having a serious conversation here uh, about him. We're taking him seriously. To non-Americans, the president-elect is still the caricature that he was to us earlier in the year. Many Middle Eastern potentates have outsized egos, and they view Trump as someone they can conceivably 
if not manipulate, uh, massage um, in the direction of their own agendas. They're also hoping for, uh, if you like, uh, the Carter human rights strategy in reverse. Uh, a Trump doctrine that closes a blind eye to human rights violations and suppression of basic freedoms and civil rights in the region. Now, um, I can't uh, sort of take apart the Middle East as competently uh, as my colleague has, uh, but um, uh, I should say that among the major players in the region, uh, such a window of opportunity might well be most narrow for the Saudi monarchy. I don't think we will see King Salman and Donald Trump hand in hand anytime soon. Despite the diminishing economic clout of Saudi Arabia, the Obama administration has abetted Saudi aggression in Yemen. The carnage the Saudis have caused in that country has made uh, Yemen significantly more unstable uh, than before the civil war. And if Trump indeed moves in the direction of minimizing uh, American commitments in the region, Yemen will not be in his list of priorities, I don't think. Trump has said little about Saudi Arabia on the campaign trail, but has made uh, the rapprochement with Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia's most uh, feared enemy in the region now, a prominent target. Yet Trump's spirited pledge to rip up the agreement, the nuclear agreement with Iran, may turn out to be little more than a hollow threat. The nuclear treaty is an international agreement concluded under the auspices of the UN, and as such, it is not for the United States to rip it up. Any effort in that direction is likely to be used by the Iranian regime to its own advantage. If the United States goes back on its commitments to the agreement, it will not be able to put back in place a comprehensive sanctions regime. While there was general support among Iranians at large for the nuclear treaty uh, in return for a relative normalization of uh, Iran's relations with the outside world, any unilateral withdrawal will be used by Iran as evidence of US ill will, which would enhance the Iranian regime's domestic and regional clout. Of course, a crisis over the treaty would be a victory only for Benjamin Netanyahu. I don't want to step on the toes of my colleague here who's going to talk about Israel and Palestine. But Netanyahu, in my opinion, is hitting the ground running already uh, since he already has the Republican establishment behind him. Trump has pledged his support for American recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. His presidency is poised to strengthen the Israeli right. Trump is likely to be a bystander, if not a cheerleader, for the expansion of settlements on disputed lands, which will seal the fate of the two-state two solution, if it has not uh, uh, done so already. Now, Turkey has come up a lot in recent days, apropos the ripple effect of the Trump presidency in the region. Trump has cast doubt on U.S. commitment to NATO, of which Turkey is a member. Turkey is on the forefront of the crisis in Syria, the war against ISIS, and the refugee problem, the Syrian refugee problem. So how Turkey perceives the Trump presidency attracts some interest, enough to put Turkish President Erdogan on 60 Minutes uh, last Sunday on the heels of President-elect uh, Trump. President Erdogan seems single-mindedly focused on the vendetta with his one-time ally, Fethullah Gülen, whom he wants extradited from the US because he, is alleged, he has allegedly masterminded the coup d'etat of last summer. There is the suggestion that Michael Flynn's lobbying firm is working on the Turkish government's behalf precisely to secure that, and uh, Flynn, um, uh, published an op-ed piece on the day of the election making the case for uh, the extradition of Gülen. Um, 
So um, uh, I think you know that's 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 sort of going to be the top agenda item before Syria, uh, you know, refugees, uh, etc. As far as Syria is concerned, Bashar al-Assad has already ex expressed his expectation that Trump will uh, uh, will align U.S. policy with Russia. Um, and Trump has made it clear that his target in the region will be ISIS, uh, suggesting that he will turn a blind eye to Assad's brutalities, which Assad cloaks as punishing the terrorists. ISIS, already in retrenchment, should welcome the Trump regime. Trump's and Team Trump's incendiary remarks about Muslims and Islam plays into the hands of ISIS's uh, project to radicalize Muslims everywhere. If and when ISIS is forced to withdraw from the territories it occupies now, it is likely to devote its attention more squarely to international uh, terrorism, uh, for which Islamophobic rhetoric, be it in the United States, France, or elsewhere, prepares a fertile ground. Trump has said that, quote, Islam hates us, unquote, his national security advisor, Michael Flynn, is on record as having stated that, quote, Islam is like a malignant cancer, unquote. It has often appeared in recent months as if the Trump campaign has gotten its cues from the playbook of the kind of authoritarian regimes preponderant in the Middle East and elsewhere. The nationalistic, misogynist, ethnocentric, and xen uh, xenophobic rhetoric Disdain for civil rights, aspersions on the rule of law, advocacy of cruel punishment, attempts to denigrate, restrict, and squelch the free press, intimidation of political rivals, denigration of democratic institutions, kleptocratic inclinations, thin-skinned knee-jerk reactions to criticism and dissent, have set a bad example and stand to vindicate and embolden leaders everywhere with similar predilections. Thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, Professor Deborah Hertz from the Department of History. Deborah. Well, thank all of you for coming out. I know it's the night before a big vacation, so, and thank you to Christine for uh, boldly organizing us. In 1921, the leader of the revisionist right-wing Zionists, Vladimir Jabotinsky, made an agreement with the Ukrainian fascist Simon Petluria. He promised to send a Jewish militia to support Petluria if and when he returned to the Ukraine. During the war, as news of the genocide was becoming well known across Europe, Jabotinsky's followers in the Lehi Splinter Party tried to appeal to Mussolini and even, according to some accounts, to the Nazi government as well, promising support for their fascist domestic politics in exchange for helping them rid their countries of the Jews which Jabotinsky intended to bring to Palestine. Petluria was assassinated five years later in Paris by a Jewish anarchist. My point here is that during the interwar period and the World War II era, Jewish society from Vilna to Warsaw to Berlin to New York City to Jaffa was beset with a powerful left-right divide. The debates among Jews about social class, about uh, alliances with political tendencies, about how to chart a Jewish future in a very unstable world were ubiquitous. No one would have assumed that all Jews held the same political opinions. Indeed, from 1905 onward, the Zionist movement had a predominantly left-wing orientation on the ground in Palestine. And although it's not known that well anymore, as time has passed, the institutions of the state founded in 1948 were imagined and constructed by socialists. We need to learn from this past. The history of Jewry between the wars should help us in the era that we're entering now, for we're clearly entering into a period in which multiple binaries uh, will become much harsher and more brittle. Judaism versus Zionism, American Jewry versus Israeli Jewry, multiculturalism versus ethno-nationalism, and left versus right are the antinomies which we have to confront head on now and in the years to come. Yes, indeed, this is Jewish laundry, being washed in a transparent global world, and it is going to be very nasty for the Jews themselves and for all those who believe in some form of national liberation. 
for the Jewish people. As I chat with my colleagues in the department and with friends over the last few weeks, I feel in my bones that we academics are plagued by so much history and so much knowledge, which we've acquired so painfully uh, and are paid to distribute, <laughs> that the present is very painful for us. I'm not whining here. I realize that this is not the same pain as the fear of deportation, nor it is the pain of unemployment or poverty or opioid addiction. Our very worries are, to be sure, a class privilege. But we do suffer. We suffer because we're living in a fun house uh, uh, of the recent election. Over and over again, we ruminate. How many times have I asked my colleague, Professor Radcliffe, what is a fascist? How is fascism different than an authoritarian demagoguery? How are hatreds connected? What is the difference between left populism and right populism? Who is in the white working class? And who defends their interest? In what language and with what programs? We rack our brains and ask each other over and over again, is the Trump victory because of or in spite of the racism, the violent language and threats, the outside the box misogyny he displayed, he channeled, and he promised during the campaign? I woke up the other night in the middle of the night and I turned to my husband in bed and I said, because of? or in spite of, <laughs> and the conversation was obviously clear what we were talking about. Of course, we should have been sleeping. <laughs> Let me turn away from these disturbing meta questions and also skirt the huge problematic, which is going to be inflamed in the next few days, of how the supporters of Sanders and Clinton and Keith Ellison of my home state, Minnesota, should move forward in the dark days to come. I want to concentrate on the mandate, which Christina very kindly handed to me, the minor issue of Israel and Palestine. I want to write some little short letters one to Trump, one to Netanyahu, one to Mahmoud Abbas, one to Obama, and one to my bête noire, Jared Kushner. I feel like I'm in the uh, wonderful Saul Bellow novel Herzog, which some of you may have read, in which he sits in an isolated farmhouse writing letters that he'll never send and no one will ever answer. But <laughs> since Christine asked me, I'm, I'm obliging her. To Trump. You've been famously vague about the choice to be interventionist in the Samantha Power uh, style and send in negotiators, troops, and planes to prevent genocide abroad, or rather return to the isolationist stance of the American right in the years before World War II. Specifically, what are your choices regarding Israeli politics? The Israeli right is overjoyed with your victory, as are the 30% of Jewish Americans who voted for you. Both groups believe that you will indeed be intervening in support of the extreme Israeli right, as Professor Kayali suggested. There are two different interventionist positions. One, which Mike Huckabee represents, is to bestow American resources in support for the right-wing parties who are to the right of Netanyahu and end the half century of annexation by annexing the West Bank. A second camp of interventionists, as represented by your possible nominee for the Department of Defense, General James Mattis, suggests that you not write a blank American check to the annexationists because doing so does not, in fact, match American interests in the region. The logic of, uh, of Mattis's views is that uh, your administration would press the local parties to come to a peace agreement, not for moral reasons, but because a peace agreement is in the interest of the United States. Your third choice would be an isolationist stance. According to the isolationist logic, the Israel-Palestine conflict is no longer the hot spot in the world. The situation on the ground for both peoples has to shift before peace is possible. I urge you, if you are listening, I know he's got nothing better to do than watch UCSD TV in the middle of the night. Maybe I should send him a tweet. Uh, what I would call an Israel a critical interventionism or the isolationist stance rather than the pro-annexationist policies of a Huckabee. To Obama, you and Clinton, for obvious electoral and material aerospace industry reasons, handed Israel a magnificent aid package last month. Now it is time to use your prestige in your lame duck weeks to act in a more even-handed manner. You should lay out the parameters of a peace agreement. You should send John Kerry to hold high-level talks with the leadership of both peoples. You should go to the UN and, and not veto any resolutions which will get recognition and state building material support to the Palestinian people. You have nothing to lose at this point, and I believe these are the values for which you stand. You are a man of principle, and there is no reason not to enact your values in the twilight of your presidency. To Netanyahu, 
You know well that the Israeli army cannot protect the settlers on the West Bank, especially those in the largely Arab regions such as Hebron and Nablus, without the backup of the Palestinian Authority police force. Yet you deny the Palestinian Authority the means to build their state. You are fully aware of how the settler project drains resources from the poor and the middle class Israelis who live inside the 67 borders of the Green Line. You and your cabinet know full well that the settlements cause anti-Semitism in the wider world and endanger the well-being of diaspora Jewry. You know fully well that Israel is making life more dangerous for Jews everywhere rather than the original aim of Zionism, which to make the world safer for Jews. And you know that you are only kicking the can down the road, that the world and enlightened American Jewish opinion will not forever tolerate the treatment of the Palestinian people that you sponsor. Uh, you know that boycotts will grow and grow, whether justified or not, and that Israel is becoming a pariah state. Ben-Gurion would cringe in shame. So look to your center and your left rather than to your right. Be the Nixon who goes to China, not the Nixon who was impeached. Let your father and your heroic brother rest peacefully in their graves and don't be beholden to their legacy. You don't need Jewish values. You just need to help the Jewish people both be both practical and humane. To Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen, call the Israelis bluff, call the Israelis bluff and go to the negotiating table. Stop the graft. Find a worthy successor. End the Palestinian civil war with Hamas. The occupation is not the fault of your people, but that doesn't mean you have no agency either. Encourage civil disobedience rather than violent protest. Violent acts against Israeli innocence, innocence only fear, instill more fear among the Israeli people, fear which is fanned by Netanyahu and his ilk. Be Gandhi, be Mandela. Make hard compromises so that no Israeli can ever say that there's no partner for peace. You too are in your twilight years and have nothing to lose by taking historic risks. Finally, and it gives me great joy to express my views here, to Jared Kushner. This morning, my dentist told me that you're not a racist, that you're not greedy, that you go to synagogue in Manhattan and your wife Ivanka is now a Jew. Of course, my mouth was open and he had his hands in it so I couldn't respond. <laughs> Yet much blood is already on your hands, and in the next years, those hands and your entire body are going to be covered by a noxious tide of blood for which you must be held accountable. True enough, you probably think that the Jews have become white, so that the slime of racism against Muslims and African Americans and Latinos will not touch the Jews. Where do you live? Do you read the newspaper? I know he owns one. <laughs> What does your rabbi, Haskell Lookstein, say when you chat with him after services? Turn away from your evil father-in-law and listen to Jews who are afraid that the racism he is unleashing will not stop at the doors of your fellow American Jews. Listen up, Jared. This is not a midterm at Harvard. Your father is long out of jail. This is a New Jersey story. And Christopher Christie has fallen of his own misdeeds. <laughs> the damage... Uh, it's no time to, you need to stop deluding yourself of the damage that your father-in-law will do to your own people. Anyone who feels comfortable judging the Jewish consuls or the Jewish capos in the ghettos and the camps of the Nazi system should judge you, and you should listen and act accordingly. Let me close with a somber prediction about the next few years for Jewish Americans. Suffering, alas, does not make for honorable heroes. Just because we're Jews, we're some of the major victims of the Holocaust, does not ensure that our Jewish values and our suffering make us immune to acting in racist ways towards other people. For years, we have lived with a frightening division among Jews about Israeli policies, policies towards the Palestinians. Now it is clear that, that we will not only face that division, but we will also face the fear that we have fallen out of the white category and will suffer as our Muslim, African American, and Latino fellow citizens are suffering. Perhaps this realignment will wake up the Jewish Trump supporters to see the error of their ways. The Anti-Defamation League is pointing the way here. Just as the Paris protesters of 1968 proclaimed we are all Jews, it is time for all Jews to proclaim we are all Muslims. 
The easy joys of the eight Obama years are over, and we all need to dig in for some very long and hard and prolonged struggles against <clears throat> hatred. In the meantime, friends and families will be rent by bitter and ugly conflict as Jewish choices and Jewish fate remain difficult and altogether public in frightening ways. Let us put our shoulders to the wheel and learn some painful histories from our own tormented history. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Paul Pickowitz uh, from the Department of History. Paul. Okay, China. So I thought I'd start with something uh, amusing, and that is uh, reactions that I've been exposed to coming out of China in recent days from party elites. And uh, the reaction is speaking to the liberal, liberal intellectuals in China. You see, you whiners, you want democracy? <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> it's being said. <laughs> it's being said. Okay. Uh, given, if we think about the uh, campaign and the phenomenon of bashing, it's hard to imagine a place that was uh, that didn't get more bashing than China. China bashing. Let's let's start with that. Uh, given the amount of China bashing in the campaign. Uh, are there going to be problems uh, with respect to Sino-American relations? Uh, big problems, major problems, catastrophic problems, all of the above. This is the big question, and of course I agree with all the speakers so far, it's far too early to know. And I'm gonna make a few suggestions here. Economic problems, for example, Steph referred to the possibility there. Uh, military encounters of one sort or another, those are, those are all problems, potential problems. So the question is, how will Chinese citizens, at all levels, from elite levels all the way down to the grassroots of society, how will they read things? And it's hard to say anything meaningful about the future of China or Sino-American relations in eight minutes. Uh, so I think all I'll do is uh, give you some context. To, to think about what might unfold in the coming weeks and months and years, uh, some, some context might help. So experience, and I go to China a couple of times every year, and I've been doing that for as long as I can remember. Uh, experience has taught me that when it comes to China, since the Communist Revolution of 1949, there's nothing more important than domestic politics. That's something you've got to know about, regardless of the moment. Uh, and this means conflict within the ruling Communist Party. Very important to understand this, not necessarily easy to get at. It was true in 1949, and it's true again today. Uh, just open the newspapers, uh, and, you'll, and you'll read about it on a regular basis. Uh, these days, this conflict is not about ideology, and by ideology I mean communism. It is very hard to find anyone in China who takes communism or the hope of a communist future for China seriously. I find it very difficult to find such people, least of all in the Chinese Communist Party itself. Uh, so communist ideology as a motivating factor for citizens was abandoned a long time ago, uh, the late 1970s, if not earlier. Since then, and this is what we need to know when we try to gauge the response of people in China to the election, uh, since then, citizen consumption and the drive to achieve higher standards of material comfort has been sanctioned as the key motivator in citizens' lives. That's what you should be thinking about. That's what you ought to try to do. And in that sort of new rules of the game, they've been winners, they've been losers, uh, and so forth. Uh, some have argued uh, that this has left what might be called a spiritual hollowness uh, in China with the 
disappearance of, of ideological zeal. Uh, and some have even said it's left a rather hedonistic society where it's all about moving up the ladder of consumption, and this determines the difference between good and successful people and losers. State leaders have tried to fill this spiritual void, and I think this is probably my main point. Uh, they tried to fill this spiritual void by doing whatever it takes to internalize strong nationalist consciousness uh, in citizens in China. So I want to talk a bit about uh, the current state of nationalism and nationalist consciousness in China. Many citizens, sometimes I'm surprised by the extent of it and the location of this kind of consciousness. Many citizens buy into it, many do not. And it's interesting to talk to those people uh, as well. And this will condition responses to almost anything, including the election. Uh, trust us, leaders say. Follow us, they say. Our goal is to make China number one. And now we have some money to play with to do that. Uh, one way of looking at this is that it's the 19th, it's 19th century social Darwinist logic. Uh, even though uh, we're supposed to be living in a globalized world, it's about nation states, loyalty to those nation states, nationalist consciousness, and the drive to be number one. This is something uh, that is very, very powerful uh, in China today. So I urge you uh, in the coming days, weeks, months, years to pay close attention to the role and the function of Chinese nationalism. Uh, it's not going to go away very soon. Uh, and it's not that China doesn't have domestic problems. Uh, they have lots and lots of nagging domestic problems. Environmental degradation that is mind-boggling to imagine if you haven't actually experienced it in China. Uh, corruption, top to bottom, inside, outside. Uh, restless, to say the least, ethnic minorities. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, so there's been obvious success. Again, all you have to do is look at the newspaper, New York Times. There's been obvious success on the economic development front, uh, but there's also great pressure to keep growth rates up, and that's not going to be easy. So that, that, is, that is a problem. Uh, but the state leaders want to be seen by all citizens as the guardian of the nation in a dangerous world. And this thrust is linked to its own sense of legitimacy. That is to say, this is what we do, this is what we care about, this is what you ought to care about, and so listen to us. So how dangerous is the world? I mean, again, we're looking uh, at, at perceptions that arise in China itself, uh, at least in my experience over the years. How dangerous is the world? Just take a look at a map of China and try to identify the nations that have to share a border with China. We share a border with two countries, Canada, who have already been nicely represented, uh, and Mexico, uh, we've also heard about, uh, and that's it. China fought, this is after 1949, China fought in Korea beginning in 1950. Uh, to put it mildly, tense relations 90 miles away with Taiwan, that's not going anywhere. Tense relations for lots of obvious reasons with Japan. Tense relations with North Korea, who would have thought? Uh, it's uh, actually at a stage of being rather amusing if it wasn't so scary. Uh, China went, had a border war with the Soviet Union in 1969. Went to war with India in the early 1960s. Went to war with Vietnam in 1979. I remember being out by the Vietnam border of China uh, that particular year, listening to the cannons exploding in the distance. Um, China is bordered by various Islamic nations to the west, nations that care a lot about China's Muslims in Xinjiang and elsewhere. So this is what the map of China looks like, being surrounded, in effect, by uh, 
nations and peoples with whom it's having difficulty. And so this is where the nationalism and the desire to build nationalist consciousness comes in. A friend of mine, uh, Professor Chen Jian, who is a professor at Cornell University in the same field, modern Chinese history, uh, he proclaimed in a lecture that I attended that the nationalism of Chinese leadership elites is nurtured by what he calls a profound victim complex. So think about that. Think about what that means. And he, his attitude toward it was very, very critical, saying that this, is, this can take on uh, very, very problematic dimensions. Uh, what does that mean, victim complex? What does that mean at the highest levels of leadership? Well, it means we were pushed around in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and we're not going to get pushed around anymore. Hence, all of these border conflicts that I just referred to. Uh, in fact, we're going to do the pushing around <laughs> because that's the measure of a great nation. Again, according to this social Darwinian kind of logic, uh, it rallies citizens and generates national pride. That is to say, when you push others around, that according to this logic, this generates national pride and uh, uh, rallies citizens. And we should add, it distracts attention from domestic problems another function of this kind of nationalism. Uh, that's why, so now I want to get to something that's happening right now, that's why the, what, let's call them the island disputes, offshore island disputes with Korea, with Japan, with the Philippines, don't be fooled by the recent trip of the new Philippine president to China, uh, with Vietnam, are so dangerous. Uh, especially the artificial, islands, the islands that are being constructed, complete with uh, airports uh, and so forth, and the territorial water rights that come with those declarations. Um, so the likelihood, we, I mean, we should think about this, uh, the, what's the likelihood of an incident occurring uh, on, on, on this particular front linked to nationalist proclivities. The likelihood of an incident in that particular sphere, if we just want to look at what I'm calling the islands dispute, I would say the likelihood of an incident is great. Uh, one that could quickly escalate into ongoing military confrontation. I think to rule that out would be, uh, would be, would be foolish. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's scary, it's scary. It wouldn't, in my view, it wouldn't take much. It wouldn't take much. And none of the parties involved will want to back down and therefore look weak. So this is a consideration that we should think about when we go back to the discussions, uh, the, the comments I made earlier about the, the, the bashing, the China bashing, that to, lot, lots of charges and claims and threats were made. Uh, and uh, I worry about what may happen. And of course, not in the prediction business, uh, but I think there's something serious there to worry about. Uh, and I just want to end by pointing to three things that I hope we talk about in the Q&A with respect to US, China, one, let's call it global, and Steph already referred to it, uh, the 12 nation uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, looks like it's up in smoke. Uh, interesting to watch from here on uh, what happens with respect to regional trade agreements. Who's doing what, who's involved, who's not involved. Non-trivial, very, very important. Uh, what will the consequences be for the United States, for example, of not putting together or being involved in something like that? Again, we don't know, but it's a big question. It deals with economics. Uh, what about the United States broadly? One of the things I'm personally very interested in is uh, what 
many have referred to as China's international soft power initiatives uh, as a way to counter the image of domestic nationalism and ultranationalism, a much softer picture of China uh, that is uh, a lot of money, let me put it that way, is being spent on, including in Hollywood. I mean, you can open up the New York Times and you'll read about uh, China's exceedingly strong interest in Hollywood uh, and what that then means for relations as one country tries to present an image of itself and therefore gain influence in another country. Uh, recent purchase by China of the AMC chain nationwide, uh, you know, interesting development. Uh, again, we, we don't know in the next several months, years, how this will play out. Uh, the whole issue of information management uh, I, th I think will be will be uh, something I certainly want to watch. And then we can even last. I would just want to say something about the local scene right here at UCSD. Uh, this is the flow of Chinese students to the United States. I learned the other day we have approximately 1,500 undergraduates from China on the UCSD campus. I just gave some lectures at Columbia University. Uh, also very significant numbers, and up and down the UC system and so forth. And I noticed one of the threats uh, in the aftermath of the election uh, was the uh, Chinese government saying, be careful what you do, we may stop the flow of students going to the United States. Now you might say, well, to the anti-immigration people, <laughs> maybe that sounds good. But to the cashiers uh, at the uh, offices of the University of California campuses, uh, this is a very scary prospect. So it's very, very interesting. So even right down to the campus level, it will be interesting to watch what will happen uh, and what its uh, impact will be in terms of cultural exchange uh, and in, even in terms of uh, cash exchange. So let me stop there and we can go on to International Center. Our last speaker, before we turn to the panel uh, addressing uh, questions to uh, one another, is uh, Henry Megala, who will speak on international education and the future. Thank you. Many years ago, I had a chance to hear Dan Rather give a talk in Fort Worth, and when he was speaking, he said when he was a young journalist, he was part of a panel and he was at the end of the panel, and as he was listening to other people speak, he was realizing he was going to have to cut here and cut there so he can fit in the time and cut there. And eventually it got to him to speak. And he got on the audience, and he looked out, and he saw one person left in the audience. And he said, I really want to thank you for staying for my talk. And the person said, I didn't. I'm the next speaker. So <laughs> But I'm glad to have the opportunity to, to bring it home. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the director for the International House here on campus. iHouse has this quarter 300 students uh, from 40 countries living together. Uh, we're one of 17 iHouses in the world. Uh, I have a sister program at UC Berkeley, and since the election, the director there, Hans Giseki, and I have been speaking a lot about how the election may affect uh, the perception and the sense of how students feel welcome to the United States and to our campuses. So I'd like to touch upon three parts of international education. Um, international students coming to the United States, our students going internationally, and how the new administration may affect all of that. Um, U.S. foreign policy leaders such as Madeleine Albright and Robert Gates have argued and stressed the importance of international students coming here to, that strengthens the ties with other countries across the globe and enhances our national security because it builds those relationships. And this has been reflected, that attitude has been reflected in our past administrations. In the last 10 years, every, every year in the last 10 years, the number of international students coming to the United States has increased to the point that last year is the first year we exceeded a million students, a million international students studying in the United States. That's an 85% increase from the number of students we had just 10 years ago. But even with those numbers, that's only 5% of all undergraduate students in the US are international students. And the other challenge is of that big number, 60% of those, over 60% of those, come from Asia and mostly three countries, China, India, and Korea. One of the challenges I think we struggle with, regardless of who's in the administration, is 
Places such as Africa that has 16% of the world's population, only 4% of their students study in the United States. Um, they have seven of the 10 fastest growing economies. And China recently announced they, they just um, approved allocated 30,000 government scholarships for African students to study in China. It's a place of the world that they recognize as important and they're investing in. Regarding US students studying abroad, in 2008, the bipartisan leaders of the National Commission of Terrorist Attacks, the 9-11 Commission, warned that ignorance of the world is, an international, is a national security liability. We need more American students having first-person experiences with the world outside the United States. And this, too, has been recognized and supported by past administrations. In the past couple of decades, the number of US students studying abroad has tripled. Um, in preparing for this talk, there are two professional associations that work with international, uh, international education. NAFSA, the Professional Association of International Educators, and the, in uh, international Insti the Institute of International Education. And I mention that because between the two of them, they say between 1 and 10% of all US undergraduate students study abroad. So regardless of which number you use, you can still say that fewer, 90% of US students will get an undergraduate university degree and have never studied outside the United States. And that's what we're producing collectively in the United States with, with, our, with our undergraduate students. So how is, the next gener how is the next administration gonna affect that? International students coming here, our students going there, and I think, as all the other speakers have mentioned, it's still speculative, we don't know. Um, there are two things. There will be policies that will be developed, but independent of policies, there will be attitudes. There will be perceptions and senses of fear. I mean, I think all of us have heard stories already about vandalism, about students being intimidated, about students being harassed. We're hearing it in our CAPS programs, our Counseling and Psychological Services. We're hearing it here on campus, that students are already being approached, assaulted, verbally, physically. Um, so in addition to what the policy, what the administration does, is the, is the national sense of fear that may be created uh, that affects international students coming here. Hopefully, as been mentioned, Mitt Romney uh, may help us with that a little bit. He's more of an internationalist than, than Trump is, and his background having organized the uh, Salt Lake City Olympics may have given him enough experience with the importance of international collaboration that may help us a little bit with that. It may not be as bad, but I think ultimately we still don't know how, how this will affect international students partly is because a lot of international students are still worried about what's going on in their own countries, whether it's Brexit, whether it's their own elections. So I want to close with, with some, since this is a policy talk, some policy recommendations that have been put forward already by the professional associations of international educators for the next administration. And this is what it reads. The pro a proactive national public-private policy initiative is imperative to generate a better understanding of global trends, increased diversity of students by gender, country of origin, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and better prepare all students to collaborate and cooperate in a globalized world. Such an initiative would articulate the importance of welcoming and educating international students to the nation, coordinate government and higher education efforts towards attracting a more diverse pool of international students, especially undergraduate students from critical areas of the world, establish targets and invest in scholarship funds to enroll more economically disadvantaged students and students from developing countries, particularly the women and girls, addressing existing US government policies and regulations that impede students coming from developing countries and countries of, in conflict, and finally, to engage the private sector as international students will contribute to a future workforce and, and consumer base. International education brings $35 billion to the US economy. To better defend US interests and more effectively address global unrest now and in the future requires a greater understanding of the world we live in. Providing opportunities for US students to study abroad and educating international students here are some of the most effective ways of doing that. The United States must proactively seek to educate a more globally and economically diverse population. The next president should make this a priority. Thank you for your time. We will turn now to members of the uh, panel who will have an opportunity to uh, 
address specific questions to other members of the panel on in areas which may not have been uh, touched upon or which uh, uh, demand uh, greater elaboration. Uh, I will start because I was struck by the fact that there was certainly two areas uh, of the world that didn't appear to uh, receive much attention from any member of the panel, any members of the panel. Those areas, of course, are Russia and uh, Western Europe, both of which there is a sense that there's going to be some sharp and decisive uh, departures from what uh, has been the approach of uh, both the Obama administration to those areas as well as the approach of the United States going back perhaps even to uh, the period of Harry Truman and uh, Dean Acheson. So I'd like uh, if members of the uh, panel would, would care to comment on how you think uh, what might be the alternatives for U.S. relations with Western Europe and of course with Russia, which depends also on what will happen uh, in those two areas as well as what the Trump administration may, may do. Um, in, in one or two sentences, uh, President-elect Trump and his strategist, Mr. Bannon, have already reached out to Marine Le Pen, and he has suggested that the perfect British ambassador to the U.S. would be uh, Mr. Farage. So we know that their instincts are very strongly with the um, isolationist, um, ethno-nationalists that are strong in every country. I mean, I think that uh, Justin Trudeau and Angela Merkel are the only people left in power in the world today who have any resemblance to the everybody's gonna get along world of the last uh, 10 or 15 years, even with ISIS, talking about open to everybody, welcome everywhere. And I think that Donald Trump will not be the end of this in the United States either. My, my response uh, to this when I heard the news today was what the British government should have done instead of saying, uh, you know, no, we can't consider that. That's, you know, we'll, we'll do that if you appoint Hillary Clinton as ambassador to uh, Britain. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that's being discussed now, and again, we don't know, um, but to the degree that um, a Trump administration focuses on uh, quotes, Islamic fundamentalism uh, as the threat. Um, there is some discussion about whether what this administration would be looking for is trying to divide up the world, sort of in a, you know, Treaty of Westphalia uh, type of uh, uh, scenario. So, you know, the Russians are in charge of that part over there. We don't really care what goes on uh, there. We're concerned over uh, in this area and pla specific places where we have uh, interests. Uh, we may clash with China over some islands, uh, but basically if China talks the uh, anti-terrorism uh, uh, lingo with respect to uh, uh, Islam, uh, we're happy to let China take care of that part uh, of the world. Uh, you know, I think in that kind of a scenario, uh, certainly Central Europe uh, loses out uh, dramatically, uh, and I don't think we can go back in history uh, and create these kinds of, of splitting up the world. Uh, certainly Islam isn't looking for a world that's split up. Uh, certainly we've made so much progress on thinking about human rights that even our populations uh, reject that kind of an idea of just letting uh, you know, somebody have a free hand to massacre people uh, uh, in those areas in the name of security. But, but I think that's one of the scenarios that's, that's out there, is that we would go to this division uh, in the world. I think we owe a, uh, a very large uh, intellectual debt to the members of our uh, panel, and I think we should give them uh, a thanks for their contribution here this evening. <laughs>